have any homework questions? Yes. Any five. <laughs> okay, number five. So this is principal stresses number five. Um, so the stress tensor that we're starting with is negative 6.18520, negative 2.2504. You might be asking yourself uh, why I came up with numbers with five significant figures like this off the top of my head. I assume that what I did is I started with the principal, started with a principal stress and then rotated it about the y-axis it looks like at something else. And then uh, that makes the eigenvalues be like whatever whole numbers I started with. Um, and then negative 0.187, and this is megapascals. Um, draw the stress element. What are the principal stresses? <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to enter is, uh, you know, every calculator has different syntax for this. So negative 6.1852. Yo, shut up, Brian. <laughs> My God. That's better. That's what I like. Okay, so this is the syntax my calculator uses. Uh, every calculator is a little different, but I'm just entering this matrix. Yeah. Uh, negative. Okay, so there's the matrix, and then I'm storing it in something, you know, put it in some variable. And then I'm just using the function igvl, and I think on the inspire, that's the name of the function also. Um, so eigenvl of a. Do you have a question, Ellie? So it takes a little while to type all this stuff in, but... Um, do eigenvalue, you know, calculate the eigenvalues of that original matrix you're given. And it gives the values negative 7.003970.000068 and negative 12. And these really are is negative 7, 0, and negative 12. Store. Yep. Stow. Yep. Um, and then if it asks for the corresponding, yeah, corresponding axes, do eigenvector on that same matrix A. And you get negative 0 0.9400, negative 0.342. That corresponds to the negative 7. Uh, positive 0 0.3420, negative 0 0.940. That corresponds to the 0. And then the last one is 0, 1, 0. Um, all my things went away. Um, 
Okay, so now uh, you have a lot of choices about how to arrange these. Um, so I think what I usually do, so these can be in either direction, okay? And any one of these can be any axis. The only restriction on these is that it has to give you a right-handed coordinate system. So x cross y has to be equal to z, okay? So what I usually do is I take the one that's closest to the x-axis, that would be the negative of this, and call that my new x-axis. Take the one that's closest to the y-axis, that's this, closest to the z-axis, negative of this, okay? And so my new coordinate system is uh, x basically that way, y that way, z, like that, and then, okay, so let me try to draw this. Man, I used to have these toolbars up there and they disappeared. Um, so, I'm going to have, if this is the original coordinate system, So let's, so what's happening here is uh, this new coordinate system is rotated like 20 degrees around the y-axis. Um, so if you had, uh, let's say, if the x was this way and y was out towards us and then z was like this, Okay, so we're looking kind of down bird's eye view of what we're used to for a coordinate system. Okay. The principal coordinate system. So this is the original coordinate system. Principal coordinate system is rotated. Uh, 20 degrees this way I just know that uh, 0.940 is cosine of 20 degrees and 0.342 is sine of 20 degrees um, I mean it doesn't matter whether you know what the angle is or whatever but um, just recognize that the y-axis stays where it is. Uh, the x-axis has is going to have um, in the old coordinate system is going to have a positive x component and a positive uh, z component. Oh shoot! Now that I say that, I did this backwards because the z uh, z-axis is down. So it would actually be like this and this. Uh, the y-axis is the same and the z-axis is um, positive z and negative x. So that makes sense. Um, okay, so this... Where are my colors? Well, all right, this axis is positive point nine four zero uh zero positive point three four two. Y axis is zero one zero, and the Z axis is um, 
negative 0 0.3420 0.940. Okay, any questions about what I was doing there? It doesn't really matter, uh, this sort of background, kind of understanding what's going on. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to do that kind of stuff on problems or anything, but. Um, And what that means is, since we're calling this one our x-axis, and our principal, so this is our x-axis, and this is our this. So the x position of our principal thread has to be that. Okay? This is our y-axis of our principal coordinate system. So the y position of that principal stress temper has to be negative 12. And this is z, so the z position has to be 0. So you can choose these to be these are their opposites to be to represent x, y, or z, however you want. But you have to make sure that the elements of your principal stress tensor go where those axes went. Okay, this one's always locked to this one. This one's always locked to this one, and so on. You know, it's yeah. You except you might have to switch the direction of them to make it a right-handed coordinate system. But in this class, you don't have to do that anyway. So yes, you can totally do that. And, eight, and so a valid principal stress tensor always will be negative 7, 0, negative 12 along the diagonal. But if you want to also make sense out of the coordinate system, it takes a little more thinking about what you, know, what you want to put where. I mean, like, you could call this your new x-axis. It's just that's really far from the old x-axis. So it's a little harder to wrap your head around, you know. It's easier to picture just taking this stress cube and just rotating it 20 degrees around one axis, you know. Yeah, that, to make it as similar as possible to the first one, that's why I did it that way. Okay, so the stress tensor then is negative 7 negative 12, zero. And this is in megapascals. Um, and so the Voigt stress is negative seven, negative 12, zero, 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 zero. And now, if you want to calculate the strain and stuff in this principal coordinate system, just calculate E based on, you know, uh, no, it's calculate the compliance matrix as a function of 200 times 10 to the ninth and 0.3. 200 times 10 to the ninth in Pascal's is steel. And, you know, that'll give you the six by six matrix. And now calculate the strain. The strain is equal to C times uh, the Voigt stress. And this is... the Voigt strain in the principal coordinate system. Yeah, I don't really have a way to do it, but that would be, that would be perfectly good. Um, and you expect to see in that, in that Voigt strain in the principal coordinate system, uh, what are going to be, what values are going to be non-zero? Well, what strains depend on what stresses, I guess is kind of the same question. Um, the, so any normal stress 
leads to non-zero normal strains in all positions because of the Poisson's effect. Okay, if you stretch something, it changes the directions of the other two axes. Okay, so unless it just happens to be a really big coincidence the way they map, uh, the first three positions of the strain are going to be non-zero. And then the shear strains only depend on the shear, the corresponding shear stress. So the shear strains will all be zero. So in other words, uh, in the principal coordinate system, you never get any angle changes. Okay, the cube stays, well, it stays a quadrilateral or whatever. Every All the angles stay 90 degrees. Yikes. Um, Okay, now we want to find the stress tensor with the maximum value of shear stress. Um, first, we can just calculate it. This is usually all you need to do. Um, and so to calculate the max, max shear stress, we want to take the, um, the maximum uh, principal stress. What's the maximum principal stress? Zero, yep. Minus the minimum principal stress. What's that? Yep, negative 12 divided by 2. So when we find the stress tensor containing the maximum shear stress, we expect it to have a shear stress value with an absolute value of 6. Anyone have any questions about that? Most often, that's all you need to do. Um, I think I have it as like where these are the maximum and minimum principal stresses. Right. Well, um, to find the stress tensor that has that, uh, we're going to do a coordinate system transformation So to find a corresponding stress tensor, So, well, let me just say rotate. So we're going to rotate the coordinate system. The coordinate system, 45 degrees, about which axis now? It has to be the axis corresponding to the middle eigenvalue. So in the principal stress tensor that we're using, um, which axis corresponds to the middle eigenvalue? X. Okay. So in this case, we want to, so middle eigenvalue. Um, you could do positive 45 or negative 45, but so our rotation matrix is going to be. Um, one, zero, 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 cosine 45, sine 45, zero, negative sine 45, cosine Um, and then we're just going to go, um, so our stress tensor with a maximum absolute value of shear is equal to Q uh, times the principal stress tensor times Q transpose.
and I get negative seven, zero, 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 negative six, six, zero, six, negative six. And so from, so now what we did, just tracking the rotations of the coordinate system, we first started out with this, right? And then we rotated the coordinate system again, 45 degrees about this axis, so that Z axis goes back, the Y axis goes sort of down, okay? And that's our coordinate system where we have the maximum shear, and that's the stress tensor corresponding to it. Yes? Do you have a solid state? Can we just tell the coordinate system the same shear at the same time? Do you have to like our stress? No, don't. Um, I think at one point I was trying to get people to do that. So maybe the um, problems, a couple of them say to do that, but don't. It's yeah, not worth it. So I just wrote the answer. That's a and better way to do it. I don't think on tests I'm even going to ever ask you to do that. Just. Um, I just sort of want you to have in the back of your mind what these eigenvectors mean. Um, um, and draw its corresponding coordinate system. I mean, come on. That's unreasonable. Um, anybody have any questions about that problem? Yes. Yeah. But you see how it works. The um, so we have these four. There only have to be two shear values that give you your maximum shear. In this case, there are four of them. But you know, if you do it right, the at least two values of your stress tensor will have absolute values. That, are, that match what you calculated with that simple formula. Yep. No, no strains have units. Nope. So any kind of strain is unitless. Any kind of stress is force per area, void or any other kind of thing. Um, No, not in every direction. It just says that uh, one of those independent shear stresses, or two of, since they're since it's symmetric, two values have absolute values that are as big as you can find anywhere. But um, you know, you can find another orientation where this has a value, this has a value, so it doesn't tell you like uh, element by element. It's just that you can't find, you can't rotate anywhere that makes either of these values uh, bigger in absolute value than six or these. Um, but, you know, the benefit of it is, like I was saying when I drew the, um, like the x-ray of the femur, the kind of compression fractures you get, you get the same kind of thing if, um, if you have like wooden posts that are holding up, uh, really big loads, when they break in compression, you'll get that 45 degree angle on the crack. And so that's why that knowing the maximum absolute value of the shear stress is important because uh, that's a value that you can, uh, that you can check to, you know, calculate that value for the load you want to apply to this body and check that against what that material is capable of withstanding. And under this loading condition, we get a maximum absolute value of shear stress of six megapascals. So if you're doing this with a material that has, that can only take five megapascals of shear stress, then the thing's going to break. Any other questions about that one? Any other homework questions?
How are you guys doing with the that's enough on that. number 18 on strain and constitutive? Um. You have a cube, it starts out with all the lengths being one centimeter. Um, and it's deformed in vertical tension. And Okay, uh, and we're going to use a coordinate system like this, the one, you know, we're used to X, Y, Z. Um, and after the deformation, so... The starting LX is 0.01. The final LX is 0.0999, right? Oh, centimeters, right? 0.00999. And then in Y, um, it starts out one centimeter, 0.01 meters, and the final deformed value is 0 0.01005. Um, and we're calculating the Poisson's ratio. So this is equal to the negative of the off axis, the um, so you have to think about, so when I gave the formula for Poisson's ratio, I gave it as we're always going to assume that the loaded axis is the x-axis and any other axis is half load axis. Um, the way I drew this, since it's being stretched vertically, um, the loaded axis is the y-axis and the x and z are the off load axes. And so um, if I'm going to use this coordinate system, it's probably easier to just change the coordinate system to always have the x-axis in the loaded direction. But using this coordinate system, Poisson's ratio would be negative E xx divided by EYY because um, this is the loaded at no, yes, this is the loaded axis. And this is the offload axis that has values given to us. You know, we need to know what the final length is to do this calculation. Um, okay, so let's calculate those two. So um, EYY is equal to uh, 0 0.01005 minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. So that one, two, three, four. So that's five times 10 to the fifth. And so then that's, I think the strain is five times 10 to the uh, minus fifth, minus third, I think, positive. That's a strain, so it doesn't have any units. And then 
EXX is 0 0.00999 minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. So that's one, two, three. So I think that's uh, negative one times 10 to the fourth minus four. What? Damn it. I guess that makes more sense with the Poisson's ratio value we're going to get. Okay, so now we can calculate. So Poisson's ratio is negative of this negative divided by 5 times 10 to the minus third, and you get 0 0.2. Nope, it's impossible. So zero is like cork. And uh, 0.5 is maintaining the same volume, and that's the entire range. What? Yeah, positive, yep. And now it asks, what's the deformed length parallel to the z-axis? Okay, well, um, So this is equal to negative e z z over e y y. Those have to be the same. You can use either one of those axes. And so what that means is 0.2 is equal to this and it's equal to this. And that means that the uh, y y, no, the x x and the z z strains have to be the same. Okay. So. Um, EZZ also has to be equal to negative 1 times 10 to the minus third. And then that's going to be equal to um, the deformed length along the z-axis minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. Um, and so that says negative 1 times 10 to the minus 5 is equal to LZ minus 0 0.01. And so LZ would be equal to uh, Zero point zero zero nine one two. Uh, I'm not going to get this right. Oh, the same as the X because they started the same. Yes, thank you. That's right. That wasn't so hard. Uh, right. Let me get smaller. But you can also use this idea, you know, if, if two sides are different lengths to start with. Um, you know the strain has to be the same, so you use that formula to calculate the deformed length. Any other questions? C. Okay. So now we know that um, so we still know this, because that's just a material thing. Once you know it for the material, you know it in any deformation. That's, that's the um, benefit of the, the tensile test. You do the one simple tensile test, and you get these parameters that hold for every other deformation, as long as you stay in the linear elastic range. 
both of those two. So think of those two things as just properties of the material. And we do the one simple test to measure them. And then it holds for everything else you do with that material. Um, and so now we know that um, okay, C, uh, we deform it. Um, so L Y is equal to point O O nine. And so EYY is equal to 0 0.009 minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. And this is a this strain is way too high to make sense physically, but mathematically you can still do it. Um, so uh, what do you get? Uh, one, two. One times ten to the minus third. I think that's zero point one, right? So yeah, if you ever see a strain of point one, like these, these techniques don't work for that at all. But this is just a mathematical exercise, um, and it should be negative. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And so now we can say Poisson's ratio is equal to 0.2, and that's equal to negative of this negative 0.1 divided by uh, EXX. And so, um, nope, I did it in the wrong order. Um, so we have negative of the off-axis strain, so that's our EXX, it's off-axis in this problem, um, divided by negative 0.1. And so sigma, I mean, uh, EXX is equal to 0.02. And 0.02 is equal to the deformed length along the x-axis minus 0.01 divided by 0.01. And so you get uh, 0.123 is equal to Lx minus 0.01. And so you get Lx is equal to 0 0.0102 here. So if you have compression along the loaded axis, you have expansion along the off axis. That's the Poisson's effect in compression. Any other questions about that one? Okay, have a good weekend. We earned it. We had two straight days of classes. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, we're going out to a fancy dinner tonight. That'll be good. <laughs>